NASA's Cassini mission was launched in 1997. It flew past Venus and Jupiter on its way to Saturn, arriving in orbit in 2004. After that, the probe was exploring the ringed gas giant till 2017. The spacecraft orbited the planet 294 times. Thanks to it, we found out about the structure of Saturn's atmosphere and its rings. We learned how the gas giant interacts with its moons. Cassini took more than 450,000 images and discovered six named moons. Thanks to this mission, we now know that there's way more to Saturn than just its impressive rings. The planet also has dozens of exotic moons. For example, Titan, a huge icy world larger than our moon. It has a dense, hazy atmosphere and seas filled with methane. Enceladus is a bright ice ball with a liquid water ocean under a frozen shell. This ocean keeps pushing towering water plumes through cracks in the moon's icy cover near its southern pole. A moon called Pon, nestled in the gas giant's rings, looks like a ravioli, and Janus looks like a meatball. One of the main questions that appeared after all the research was why some of Saturn's moons had liquid water oceans while others were completely dry. It may have to do with the age of the moons. Enceladus, Titan, and probably Dione have liquid water oceans. But Mimas, which is much closer to Saturn than Enceladus and could generate enough heat to maintain a liquid inner ocean, doesn't. If we found out that Mimas was younger than those ocean moons, it would explain why it's dry. Researchers think that Mimas might be less than one billion years old. It probably formed from loose material in Saturn's rings. This way, by the time the debris formed into the moon, it would have had billions of years to lose its radioactive heat. And without this heat inside, Mimas just wouldn't have enough outside heat to melt its ice into a liquid water ocean. And still, some scientists think that there might be an ocean on Mimas. The thing is, Cassini found that the moon wobbles in a bizarre way as it rotates on its axis. This mystery could be explained by either an irregularly shaped core or a liquid ocean sloshing underneath the icy surface. Now, those oceans on Saturn's moons, are they similar to the oceans on Earth? Well, the one on Enceladus is salty, just like what we have on our planet. And it may be a sign that the water chemically interacts with the moon's rocky core. It increases the chances of simple life forms swimming in that salty ocean. On our planet, this type of interaction provides energy and nutrients to creatures thriving on the dark ocean floor, miles beneath the surface of the ocean. The same could be happening on Enceladus. Titan also has a liquid water ocean, but it's still unclear whether it interacts with ice or rock on the ocean bottom. The oceans on Saturn's moons might have been around for billions of years since it's a tricky task for a subsurface ocean to form after the formation of a moon. How exactly did they appear? Still unclear. With Enceladus, it could be a giant impact. Titan's ocean could have formed together with the moon itself. Or it could have been melted by the heat from radioactive decay happening deep in Titan's interior. Could the oceans on Saturn's moons have life? We don't know for sure yet, but they might. Enceladus is on the top of NASA's list of the worlds that might host life. This moon seems to have three of life's most important ingredients. Liquid water, the right chemical ingredients, and a source of energy. Cassini discovered hydrogen and phosphorus on the moon, which are essential chemical elements for life. As for Titan, it has not only an internal ocean but also a dense, nitrogen-rich atmosphere and complex carbon chemistry. It's still not clear whether it has life, but it definitely could. Oceans aside, another curious thing about Saturn is that its rings are slowly disappearing. So are the moonlets living among them. Researchers believe they might be almost completely gone in the next 100 million years. Saturn pulls the rings into itself using its powerful gravity. This planet's called the jewel of the solar system. Made up mostly of gases, it could float on water should you find a reservoir 75,000 miles across and just as deep. 
But what makes the planet so recognizable is its beautiful rings, gray, tan, and beige. They consist of dust, rocks, and ice. Some bits are as tiny as grains of sand, others as large as skyscrapers. The planet I'm talking about is Saturn, and right now, Earth is hurtling toward it at breakneck speed. It all started on a regular day over half a year ago. All of a sudden, Earth changed the course it had been following for several billion years. But instead of rushing toward the Sun, it started to move away from the star. On second thoughts, it might be for the better. We've got more time to find a solution. Earth used to move around the Sun at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour. For some mysterious reason, when it left its orbit, the speed remained the same. It means we're going to cover 746 million miles separating our planet from Saturn within a year and three months. At first, no one realized what had happened. But a couple of hours later, it became obvious. Despite the panic that engulfed Earth's inhabitants, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. But all too soon, it started to get colder and colder. Astronomers' forecasts were pessimistic. People started to leave their homes at the poles, move closer to the equator. Most plant and animal species were having a hard time. Some of them went extinct, even though we were trying to save them in greenhouses and special conservation parks. The sky changed dramatically. In a week, we could see Mars clearly. It looked like a big reddish sphere hanging low over our heads. Jupiter became as bright as the moon. Once Earth was as far away from the sun as Mars, days became twice dimmer than they used to be. At first, our planet's atmosphere was acting as a barrier between people and space. That's why we didn't feel the cold immediately. But seven days later, everyone who dared to leave their home had to be cocooned in heavy winter clothing. By that time, the temperatures had already dropped down to minus 145 degrees Fahrenheit. It got even colder once our planet passed Mars and hurried through the asteroid belt. It's been one of the most dangerous regions on our way so far. Yes, people could admire awesome meteorite showers streaking the sky. But several space bodies managed to get through the Earth's atmosphere. They slammed into the ground, flattening mountains and leaving behind gigantic craters. They caused tsunamis and triggered earthquakes. Right now, most of the planet, including the oceans, has already turned into an icy desert. There's a lack of food and natural resources. We've built underground towns and tunnels connecting them. Our scientists work day and night to find a way out of this situation. If they don't, that's what's going to happen. The closer our planet will be to Saturn, the more the ring planet will loom over the horizon and the larger it'll look. Soon, it'll already shine brighter than the full moon. The massive yellowish-brown orb will be visible even during the day, but it'll look especially impressive at night. Instead of sleeping, millions of people will spend hours watching Saturn grow larger and larger. One day, the distance between the two planets will become the same as the distance between Earth and Mars used to be. Saturn's disk will be about a quarter the size of the full moon. Its rings will be as large as two-thirds of our natural satellite. Soon after that, our planet's speed will start to increase under the influence of Saturn's gravitational pull. The ringed planet is nine times wider than Earth, and its mass is almost 100 times greater. That's why, instead of moving at a speed of 29 miles per second, we'll be dashing through space at almost 40 miles per second. That's 2,400 times the average car speed. Saturn's gravity will influence the Moon more than that of Earth. In no time, we'll lose our satellite. It'll get catapulted into outer space, likely to go into an elliptical orbit around the Sun. If Earth wasn't about to crash into Saturn in the nearest future, the Moon could one day cross paths with our planet again. No good would come out of such an encounter. But what's happening on Saturn's side of things? Saturn is one of the largest planets in the solar system, second only to Jupiter. Even though the rings surrounding the planet are huge, they're rather thin, less than a mile thick. Still, the main rings are large enough to stretch from Earth to the Moon. But how did the planet get these breathtaking accessories? Beyond the outer edge of the main rings, A, B, and C, there's something astronomers call the F-ring. Several million years old, it's the weirdest one. 
This constantly shifting ring is made up of icy material and is incredibly complex. Its curves, twists, and clumps of brighter substance make it look as if it's braided. Saturn has more than 50 confirmed moons. Two of them, Pandora and Prometheus, flank the F-ring on either side. They weave outside and inside the ring, acting like shepherds. They herd ice particles into a 60-mile-thick band. But why are they performing this elaborate dance? No one knows. What scientists do know is that when Saturn's rings were evolving, icy material clumped together and formed moonlets. Some of them grew and turned into the planet's largest moons. But two of them collided. That's how the mysterious ring F appeared. If the moonlets had only been made up of small icy particles, the space collision would have left a ring and nothing else. But they had dense rocky cores. Those remained intact and turned into Pandora and Prometheus. People don't have any evidence Saturn's ever collided with another space body. Our Earth might be the first. But before crashing into the planet itself, we'll have to get through its rings, including the Ring F. And no, our planet won't just punch a hole in them. Saturn's rings are made of small particles. Earth's gravity will start to pull some of them out of their orbit once we're close enough. It'll result in a long plume that will reach our planet. And later, when we squeeze through, the cloud of icy particles will drag after Earth. It won't have enough power to rid Saturn of its rings completely, though. They'll continue to move around their home planet, but their orbits will change and become more elongated. There will be no more stunning bands. Over time, the rings could probably settle down again, but Earth won't give them such a chance. The collision with our planet won't leave Saturn unscathed. If there's still a possibility to sneak a peek at the sky, people will be able to see the rings disappear into nothingness, but not for long. Soon, the largest chunks of rock will start hitting the surface of our planet, leaving behind lifeless land dotted with craters. In the worst-case scenario, Earth might even collide with one of Saturn's numerous moons. But let's imagine we've passed through this region in one piece, and now our planet's very close to Saturn. The gas giant might seem airy, but there's no way Earth can fly through the huge sphere and leave from the other side. Gravity is what keeps all that gas together the very gravity that make our planet speed up. The closer it is to the much bigger space body, the stronger the pull is. It'll cause the fault lines on Earth to rupture. It'll also set off powerful volcanic eruptions all over the world. And then, with enormous force, our planet will crash into Saturn. The planet's atmospheres will get compressed. This will cause a dramatic and fast temperature rise, and in no time, the air will be on fire. Scientists claim that Saturn's core is dense, made up of iron and nickel, and surrounded by a rocky layer. But we'll never make it there. Earth will burn in the bigger planet's atmosphere after being literally torn apart. Our beautiful, blue-green world will turn into billions of trillions of tons of vaporized rock. Pity. Maybe Earth will become yet another Saturn's ring, instead of the ones it's ruined. Sounds grim, I know. Yeah, we can't save Earth from Saturn, but that's only a bad dream. So maybe we take that effort and save us from a real threat, climate change. Eh, just saying. Now, let's pretend that humanity faces a huge threat from outer space. So we'll imagine that a uh, giant planet-eating octopus comes to our solar system to eat uh, Venus, Mars, Earth, um, Jupiter, and other planets, except Saturn. Therefore, people decide to move to the big planet with giant rings. Fortunately, they already have cool technologies that allow them to make such trips. So we get into giant ships, take off, and fly to Saturn. Life on the planet itself is impossible because it has no solid ground. The ship won't be able to land there. This is a giant gas ball that is nine times wider than Earth. To compare their sizes, look at a five-cent coin and a baseball. And the planet's atmosphere consists mainly of hydrogen and helium. So if the ship starts to land, it'll never reach solid ground. And the lower it goes, the higher the pressure it will experience. Eventually, the ship will just be crushed. Therefore, we have only one choice. The rings of Saturn. 
They're made up of giant, medium-sized, and tiny particles of ice and rock flying around the gas giant at tremendous speed. They were formed from comets flying by. Saturn's gravity knocked these celestial bodies off their course and crushed them with its pressure. Fragments of these comets began to accumulate around Saturn, forming rings. Now, Some of these particles fly faster, some are slower. The closest to the planet is the D-ring. It's followed by rings C and B. Then there's a large gap called Cassini division. Rings A, F, G, and E come after. This classification is very convenient for creating a ring map. So, people approach the rings, but don't dare to land on them. First, they send test capsules with robots to scout the area. The robots choose a suitable location on the E-ring. In fact, the distance between the rocks is quite large, and the ship can easily fly there. There are tiny particles, huge rocks the size of houses, and comets the size of a whole mountain. The first robot flies up to a large rock at high speed. At this moment, a baseball-sized stone pierces the robot's body. Another robot gets smashed between two colliding boulders. The third robot gets caught in a rain of sharp icicles and breaks. People have big engineering workshops on their ships, so they build new capsules and new robots. This time, they're made of more durable materials, so the robots reach a big rock again. A few particles crash into them, but don't break through the armor. The machine set up a small station on a flying rock where people can live. But after a couple of hours, a big chunk of asteroid smashes the station. Well, seems like we need another strategy. Giant ships scan the entire area of the E-ring and calculate the trajectories of billions of stones. After lengthy calculations, people finally find the perfect places in the middle of this chaos that will stay intact for a long time. They land on these large rocks in their capsules and begin to settle down. They build stations and small houses and install powerful batteries on them. Saturn is located at a distance of 9.5 astronomical units from the Sun. One unit is the distance from the Sun to Earth. So Saturn is a pretty cold place. That's why there's so much ice flying around it. But how to get the energy to heat it all up? There's too little of it on large ships. Besides, solar panels are ineffective here because of the great distance from the sun. Therefore, scientists create a way to generate kinetic energy from flying stones. It's like a windmill. When the wind drives the fans, these movements are converted into energy. So engineers build panels that collect power from the moving stones. But it doesn't slow the speed of rocks down because Saturn's gravity continues to move them. Thus, people receive a source of almost limitless energy. Some space stations have plants and trees that produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Only instead of sunlight, they get energy from ultraviolet. Then people fill large tanks with oxygen and carry them to their homes. People begin to occupy the adjacent rings. You don't need a lot of fuel to get from one place to another. You can land on a rock, calculate its route, and wait for it to bring you to the needed point. Then you can move to another one, and so on, until you reach your destination. More and more people leave their ships and move to the rings. It seems that life is getting better. But then psychological problems begin. Constant movement in the vacuum of space drives everyone mad. Imagine living on a carousel that never stops. You can't walk to the store whenever you want because it always flies away. No one can go out for a walk, even in a spacesuit because there's a chance to come across a rock flying at high speed. You can't plan anything because, at the moment, your plans can be ruined by a giant piece of ice. Computers don't help either. They can't calculate the trajectories of all space bodies. Rocks tend to break and split into hundreds of smaller ones. Also, new comets fly by and also become part of the rings. All this creates uncertainty and causes a sense of anxiety in people. Besides, it's dark, cold, and very lonely on the rings. Now think about building a base on a space object. But your best friend lands on another one a few miles away. Then a giant icicle crashes into his rock and increases its speed. And a few days later, your friend is too far away. And it happens all the time. The only way to change your life is to settle on one of Saturn's moons. The planet has 83 of them. 
people have already confirmed and named 63, and the existence of 20 others has yet to be confirmed. They're all like different worlds. Some of them may be habitable, and the best candidate among them is Titan. There may be water on it, and its atmospheric pressure is only one and a half times greater than Earth's. Its atmosphere consists of nitrogen and a little methane, forming carbon smog in Titan's upper layers. For this reason, we can't study this moon from Earth. But the coolest thing is that Titan flies outside the rings of Saturn. This means people can lead a quiet life there. There's also satellite Phoebe, covered with craters like our moon. This giant celestial body looks more like a gigantic meteorite. People have a lot of choices of where to start a new life. During a couple of hundred years spent on ships near Saturn, humanity would learn everything about its satellites. But why did they try to live on the rings? Why didn't they land on one of the moons from the very beginning? Because, well, then this video would be less fun and a whole lot shorter. But what if we were initially born inside the rings of Saturn? Let's say a massive meteorite with frozen water got caught by the planet's gravity. There were the simplest life forms inside the ice. And then, this life began to acquire more developed forms. Imagine that the large rock managed to remain untouched for hundreds of millions of years. And during this time, humans appeared. But of course, they would be very different there. Firstly, they wouldn't experience gravitational forces. This would make them taller, but weaker. People's skin would be pale because of the lack of light, but very hardy thanks to cold temperatures. Particles of ice and grains of sand flying in space would roughen people's skin. In such biological armor, without gravity, they would jump from one rock to another in search of food and water. And by the way, that would be the main problem. How would people survive without oxygen in the vacuum of space? Where would they get their food? Saturn's rings are a pretty lifeless and dangerous place. If there are not even the simplest forms of life there, then how could such a complex one as the human appear? Therefore, even in theory, the appearance of people would be impossible there.